Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Parks Expedition Challenge. Today is so exciting for us because today is our 100th filming of the National Parks Expedition Challenge and we've chosen a very special place to be at. We are at the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park and the reason we chose this besides it being just an amazing place is my Pawpaw, Pawpaw Brown, worked here as a young lad and on through his life. My great-grandfather worked here my great uncle worked here and my sweet aunt betty who is here with us today was born here at guilford courthouse national military park so saying all of that you can tell that i'm excited to be here but also excited to be here with ranger jason ranger jason first of all thank you so much for allowing us to be here today oh thank you well tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to the parks so I am a uh, interpretive ranger here, which basically means I'm a historian who happens to wear a uniform. And the way I got to the National Park Service was I've always studied history. So I went to college and got degrees in history. And then I got another degree where I focused specifically in what we call museum studies, which is the idea that we study history, but then we got to figure out different ways to make programs for uh, the average folks who come to our park so they can understand what we've learned as well. So you're a walking history book. <laughs> I'd like to, I like to think that, yeah. And how long have you been here at this park? I've been here for about seven years now. Well, there is so much history here, but we also hear cars and different things. So this is kind of an urban park. Would you consider yourself an urban park? Yes, we do. And uh, that's kind of an interesting challenge we deal with a lot of the time is because when this battle was fought back during the American Revolution, it was just all farmland, but uh, you know, lots changed in over 200 years. And so now we have a city literally all around us. Well, we'll talk about that challenge a little further on and maybe give our kids something to think about, but tell us about this place. So Guilford Courthouse National Military Park preserves a battlefield of the American Revolution. Uh, this place would have been a you know, battlefield back in 1781. So where we're standing actually is the Hoskins farm and these are reconstructed buildings, but they represent the actual house and kitchen of a family who would have lived here during the time of the battle. Now, luckily they got away before the battle started, but then the British army comes and kind of starts the battle here, but proceeds all the way through what is today our park. Uh, it's a long battle, it's about two and a half hours. And at the end of the day, the British are actually gonna win this battle, but it's an interesting concept because while they win in the sense that they make the Americans leave, we consider them losers here. We call it a Pyrrhic victory, which is basically a fancy way of saying that the British win, but in the process of winning, they lose so many of their men and they run out of supplies that they really don't actually achieve anything. Well, I think it would be interesting to know that in 1776, we signed the Declaration of Independence. And we fought this in 1781. Mm -hmm. So why are we still fighting the British? Because it's one thing to declare your independence, it's a completely different thing to actually make that a reality. And so the American Revolution, the war for independence, goes on for almost eight years. It starts in 75, we get the Declaration of Independence in 76, but then it keeps going on after that because the British just don't give up because the Americans say they're independent. There's a lot of battles up in New England, there's a lot of battles up around New York and Pennsylvania, and then this is kind of the end of the war, the last period of the war, and the reason the British are down here at this point is they're trying to recruit loyalists. So the idea is that Americans who are still loyal to the British crown, the British are coming down here because they essentially want to recruit them into the army and try and win the war that way. Are there any special stories or people that we would be interested in knowing about? Well, a couple of interesting people who would have been here would have been the Hoskins family themselves. Uh, they were originally living up in Pennsylvania. And the irony is that they left Pennsylvania because battles up there got too close for comfort. So they came down here thinking they were getting away from the war. Instead of having battle come close, they have a battle come right through their farm. Oh, wow. A couple of other interesting people are the commanders. Uh, General Cornwallis, the commander of the British Army here, He's a very aggressive combat commander. He's trying to defeat the Americans. And yet, before the war, he was against all the uh, coercive acts and the parliamentary acts that were making the Americans angry. And then the other interesting person would be the American commander, Nathaniel Green. Uh, he was originally raised as a Quaker. So Quakers are pacifists, they don't believe in war. But Green disagreed with that. He pursued a military career, obviously. 
And another interesting thing about him is that he had a long road to become a commander here. Before he's doing this, he was what we call a quartermaster general. And that's basically the person who's in charge of supplies. And he hated that job. But it ended up being a good thing for him because during those years of doing that job, he learned how to manage his supplies, manage his troops, and all that stuff that he learned doing that job, he applies to being a combat commander down here in the South. Am I uh, correct in saying that Robert E. Lee's father fought in this battle? Yes, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee is who, what we call him. He was a cavalry commander here. He has some troops who are actually gonna be on the south side of the battlefield. And when the day starts, it's his guys who are out scouting ahead of the army, trying to figure out where the British are and what they're doing. Well, when we see pictures or, or depictions of pictures from the war, Revolutionary War, we see that the British, um, the Redcoats, mm -hmm. as we called them, were all decked out in their uniforms. But when you see us, they're not. So tell us about what they wore and did someone give them the clothes to wear? Was there like a formal militia or a formal recruiting process? It's a great question because the American army, they are trying to have their own professionals. Those guys are called Continentals and they do try and wear uniforms, but they don't always have the supplies they need. That's the biggest thing the American army is dealing with the entire war is that they don't have what they need. So while they want their guys to dress in blue, they can't always put them in blue. So sometimes at this battlefield, we'd see a couple units dressed in brown coats because they're essentially just taking whatever they can get. But the majority of soldiers here aren't even professionals. They're not redcoats, they're not continentals, they're what we call militiamen. There's a North Carolina line of militiamen in the front line of the American army, and then there's a second line of guys from Virginia. But what makes militia different from those professionals is that a professional signs a contract, and for many years, that's their job every day. They get up and they work at being a soldier, they get all their equipment given to them, they get a uniform. Militiamen aren't professionals. They have a normal day job, and they only serve in the military once every couple months. And when they serve, they only serve for like two to three months at a time. And when they practice, they're not practicing every day, they're only practicing maybe once every three or four months. On top of that, they don't get a uniform, so what they wear is just whatever they have available. They have to bring their own clothes, they have to bring their own guns, so that's why we can have nicely dressed red coats. We can have some Continentals who are kind of in the same color. But then when you look at the militiamen, you've got all kinds of different styles of dress, different colors of clothing. And it's because they're just bringing whatever they got to the battlefield. It was interesting to hear you bring up Quakers. I am a Quaker. Hmm. My father, uh, it was a Quaker minister. My uncle Jack was a Quaker minister. And I, I read or saw a video that the Quakers uh, in New Garden mm -hmm. were who they brought the wounded to from the British side and the American side. Can you talk about that for a moment? Absolutely. Uh, so from where we are, uh, we have a main road that runs through the battlefield called the New Garden Road. That's how both armies got here. But if you go four miles, to the west of where we are, then you get to New Garden. And so the battle actually starts there that morning. And early morning, the two armies have a short little skirmish uh, at New Garden before the Americans fall back to where we are. And after the battle, they, despite the fact that they're pacifists and they're not taking sides in this war, they still feel it's their duty to try and help uh, ease people's anguish and stop suffering in the world. And so that's why the British are able to bring so many wounded to them, because they still feel it's their duty to try and help other people in this world. And so they do help a lot of people there. and. In their graveyard, they also have a lot of soldiers from both sides who are buried there to this day. When, when I see pictures or see uh, reconstruction or of the videos and things like that, it's a very polite war. Like it looks, they stand in lines and they, they wait and it's almost like one side will shoot and then the other side will shoot. That doesn't seem very typical. Why, why did that happen? We get that question a lot because people are wondering, you know, why aren't they trying to hide and take cover? And why they just, it looks like they're standing out in the open, taking turns, shooting. Really, it all boils down to what their weapon can do. They're using things called muskets in this era. They're really slow to low and they're extremely inaccurate. So the tactics they use of getting in giant lines, firing what we call volleys, which is when everybody fires their weapons at the same time. All of those tactics are trying to work around what the weapons can and cannot do. So the way they thought about battles back then was they get a big mass of guys together, I get you all to fire at the same time. And essentially we're throwing clouds of bullets through the air and maybe somebody hits something. So that's why you can stand out in the open close to your enemy, but not necessarily get shot very quickly. So maybe that's where the do not fire until you see the whites of their eyes comes yes. from. They needed to be close enough mm -hmm. to be able to see that. What would a day in the life of a continental army or militiamen look like? Well, 
while we all tend to study the battles more, the average day life would probably be a lot of boredom. Um, so on some days you might be marching around the battlefield and during this campaign we know guys are expected to march about 16 miles a day, six days a week. That's how fast these armies are moving around. But when you're not marching around, all you're doing is kind of sitting around in camp. So some guys might be put on guard duty where you guard the camp. You might have chores in camp to try and keep the camp uh, clean. You might uh, be working together as a unit, practicing how you use your musket. And another thing you might do is you might be sent out to do what is called foraging. And foraging means that you go out into the countryside, go to a farm like this, and you try and see what the farmers have to uh, feed your army. And ideally, you pay for it, but sometimes both armies would just take what they needed, unfortunately. I read that a young slave from the east, eastern part of North Carolina was sent by his master to come and fight. And he was promised freedom mm -hmm. when it was over. And that didn't happen at first. Do you have a story about him? Yes, Ned Griffin is the man who was sent here. And there's a weird story about the, the man who sent him had run away from the Continentals. And so what he was doing was that when he got caught, they're gonna force him back into the unit and finish out his service. But he made a deal so that he literally bought Ned so he would serve in his place so that he wouldn't have to. And he's told Ned that if you do this for me, I will free you. Ned comes to the battle. Ned serves his full time. He does it honorably in the army. And when it comes time for him to be freed, the guy who had purchased him refuses. And the, but, but fortunately for Ned, his story was heard by someone in the North Carolina legislature. They took up his case and they decided that, well, no, you made a deal with him. He served honorably, he deserves his freedom, and they were the ones who ultimately forced uh, the man to free Ned Griffin. I also heard that the British enlisted um, slaves because they promised them freedom also. And they, even though they sort of switched sides, they wanted that freedom because the freedom that the uh, people here were trying to get was just for themselves and not for the slaves. Absolutely. Uh, so that is a big bone of contention here in the South is can the enslaved people of the South play a big role in this war? The Continental Army ultimately doesn't decide to enlist. There are many generals who want to enlist enslaved people and give them their freedom, but the local legislatures of the Southern colonies refuse that. The British were essentially saying, if you serve with us, you will get your freedom. They don't necessarily always put them in combat positions, but they do put them in a lot of positions of uh, helping with supply lines, helping with construction. But even that wasn't a giant promise to everybody. What typically ends up happening is that the British will give freedom to an enslaved person who can prove that uh, the person who was enslaving them was a rebel. But if the person who was enslaving you was a loyalist, sometimes they held you in slavery until you could be returned. So we talked about what a day in the life would look like, but by the magic of video, we have someone here. He's changed. I feel very underdressed right now. <laughs> you look great. Well, thank you. So tell us about this and what this would have looked like back in the day. So basically, I'm just very weird right now because I'm representing the most common type of soldier that would have been at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. So we talked about, you know, we typically hear about the redcoats, right? The British soldiers in the American Revolution, the professionals. And what makes them professional along with the Continentals on the American side is that what they did was they signed a contract one day and that became their job. They became a soldier every day. They practiced at it, they march around a lot, they work with their muskets, and over their long service, they're probably in a few battles. And so what makes them professionals, what makes them good at what they do is they have practice and experience. Then we get to me. I'm dressed as a militiaman. And what makes a militiaman different is that he doesn't sign a contract and that isn't his job every day. He has a job. He's either a farmer, shopkeeper, a tinsmith. He has something else that he does for work and he only serves in the military every once in a while, maybe not even every year. When he serves in the military, he's not serving for years and years, he's not even serving for a full year. He might serve for maybe three months at a time. And then when he's practicing, he's not practicing every day. He's maybe practicing once every three months and if he's taking that practice seriously, can be different between one militia unit and the next militia unit. So when we think of militiamen, we gotta think of guys who don't have a lot of experience, don't have a lot of practice, and they don't have uniforms and cool gear. They have to bring all their own stuff. The army will feed them, it will pay them, and it will give them uh, ammunition, but beyond that, they have to bring everything else. So when we look at me, I'm not wearing a uniform. I'm just wearing the latest and greatest fashion of the 18th century, whatever I had at home that I thought would be comfortable to wear for three months. 
Now, I am holding a musket right here. This is the weapon of the time. Uh, this is what a Continental would be carrying. But a militiaman would have to bring whatever he had at home. So he might bring either a rifle that he goes hunting with, uh, or he might bring what is called a fowling piece, essentially a shotgun in the 18th century. And that would be his weapon. Now, regardless of whether it's a fowling piece or it's a Charleville musket or a brown vest musket, all these things essentially work the same way. The reason they are fighting the way they do in this era is that they are trying to work around what this thing can and cannot do. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice is that how big it is. This thing takes nine to 12 steps to load and fire one bullet. Once you fired that one bullet, you get to repeat the entire process all over again. Now, another problem with this is about what happens with the bullet. To speed that long process up, the way these things were made is that the inside of the barrel is actually smooth like a pipe. In addition to that, the little musket ball they put in here is smaller than the barrel, so it goes in nice and easy. The problem with that is when it comes back out. When it comes back out, it has just enough room to rattle around all the way out. And when it rattles out the end of the barrel, whichever way it was going, that's the way it's gonna keep flying. And you can't predict that. So the way they thought about battles back then was they get everybody in a giant line, they get them all to fire together. That's what we call a volley. And what they were thinking was, I get all my, sol all my soldiers to essentially throw a cloud of bullets through the air. Maybe somebody will actually hit something. But that's why they fought the way they did. Giant lines, close together, firing almost looks like they're taking turns. They're working around what this thing can and cannot do and how it actually works. Can you actually demonstrate? Absolutely, yeah. I can load this and fire it off for you so you can get a sense of the time it takes and also the sound that it produces. That would be great. So muskets of this era, like I said, take nine to 12 steps and the entire process starts right here with what is called the lock. This is called a flint lock, fire lock. We're referring to this mechanism right here. This actually makes the entire weapon work. One of the first things a soldier might do is he holds the hammer back one click and that puts the safety on. Safety basically means that when you load the weapon but go to squeeze the trigger, nothing happens. But what I've also done is I've opened up a little pan on the side of the barrel, and I'm gonna put some priming powder in there. That's gonna get the entire weapon to fire. Right beside the pan is also a tiny hole in the side of the barrel called the touch hole. That's what allows the spark to go inside of the weapon and hit the main charge. The soldier would then take another piece of ammunition out of a cartridge box. Typically there's a pre-rolled packet of gunpowder and musket balls, but there's no musket balls in these today. He'd tear it open with his teeth, put a little powder in the pan, shut the pan, and then he'd take everything else, the paper, the powder, and the musket ball, shove it down the muzzle. Takes out what is called a ramrod to make sure everything is packed down into the weapon, puts the ramrod back, and at that point, the weapon is ready to fire. What happens when he actually fires is that he pulls the hammer back a second click, and when he pulls the trigger, the hammer's gonna fly forward, and this piece of flint right here, this little rock, is gonna hit this piece of metal, pop it open, but at the same time, it's gonna scrape against the metal causing sparks. Sparks will hit that little bit of powder that he put in to start. You get a flash, flash goes inside the barrel, hits the main charge, get a big boom, musket ball flies out. That's the entire ridiculous process these soldiers have to do every single time they wanna fire one bullet. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go through that exact process that I just described to you. So a soldier might be marching around the battlefield in a very stiff posture, and even this had a purpose, because if he's got guys to his left, his right, and behind him, and he starts letting this go slack, making turns, they're gonna start smacking each other in the heads. So even when they have the rigid posture in these giant lines, that has a purpose. You gotta keep these things from swinging around. One of the first commands a soldier might get would be, recover, fire lock. And all he does is he brings the weapon down, points it in the general direction he's shooting, but he puts the lock right in a position where he can work on it. The next command would be, half cock, fire lock. Pull back that one click, open up the pan, Handle, cartridge. Reaches back into his cartridge box and pulls out one of those pre-rolled packets of gunpowder. Tears it open with his teeth. Prime. Pours a little bit of the powder into that pan. Shut, pan. Shuts it, holds it in place. Swings around. And on the command of charge with cartridge, everything else goes down. Draw, rammer. Gets out the ramrod. Ram down, cartridge. Packs it into the weapon. Return, rammer. Just like that, the weapon's loaded, it's on safe. He brings it up to the shoulder. So either it can be marched around the battlefield or he can go directly into firing, which is what I'm gonna do now. Poise, fire lock. Brings the weapon up. Cock, fire lock. Swings it around, pulls it back that second click. And here we go. To game. Fire! And as you can see, a lot of smoke produced on this as well. 
Something to keep in mind with battles back then is that you have giant lines firing all together. They're all belching out tons of smoke together. And in just a few minutes of two lines firing at each other, the battlefield will be completely obscured by smoke. You at the very beginning talked about the encroachment and how this was a place of forest and woodlands and you actually have a map mm -hmm. that shows that now. But what are your challenges here with the city coming in around you? So part of, the re part of the difficulty is that as encroachment has taken over parts of the battlefield, when someone comes here wanting to learn about the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, we have to use a lot of our imagination, unfortunately. We can't just point to open fields and say, this is where this unit was and this is where you this unit was, because now we have apartment buildings where a field used to be. We have woods where there used to be an open field. We have streets and roads bisecting the battlefield where at the time of the battle, there was only one road running through here. So one challenge is we have to try and do as best as we can to help people use their imagination to try and see what this place actually should have looked like. And so another thing that we deal with is just the noise. Uh, with all the kind of cars and everything going around all the time, it's hard to imagine yourself being out in the dense wilderness when you can hear all the other people moving around at all times. Well, I think that's going to lead us to our STEM challenge. So kids, we're going to ask you to think about parks that may be near you that are being encroached upon by the outside world. How do you continue to tell the story um, and have people realize that this is the way it was? Now here at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park, they do an amazing job with that, with props and maps and interpreting what this place was. But how can we make this even better by maybe coming up with some ideas where encroachment doesn't happen and where parks that are being preserved, um, things can't be bought around there. These are kids that really can solve problems, right? So yeah. we want you to get on that. We want you to think about how you can have your voice heard so that places like Guilford Courthouse and places near you will continue to be able to tell the story even though we hear the outside noises coming in. So you're gonna tag at Dacia 92, and you're also gonna tag the Guilford Courthouse Military Park, National Military Park, that's gonna run across the bottom of the screen because Ranger Jason and the people he worked with would love your ideas. They need to interpret this park the way it was. So having some new ideas, some fresh blood, if you will, I think would be great for them. Ranger Jason, there's so much history here. There's so many stories here. Our goal as the National Park Expedition Challenge is to make sure that kids hear all the stories, all the sides, mm -hmm. let them make their decisions. Let us learn from the past so that in the present day, we can make better decisions for our future. There are people out here that want that hat. They want that badge. They love the gray and, uh, green and brown and they love that whole color palette. Can you give them any advice on what they can do now in school to get prepared for a job with the National Park Service? And you can talk right to the camera. Yeah. So one of the best ways you can prepare for, for me in particular, I'm a historian, so study history. Pursue not only learning about how the past happened and understanding and how you can do deeper research, but start thinking about if you want to share that information, what are some creative ways you can share that information? Because that's ultimately, yeah, well, that's ultimately what you have to do as a ranger is you need to figure out, well, I know this, but how can I get other people who aren't as interested in history to engage with that and understand that? Um, another thing you can do is you can always volunteer when you get older. Uh, not only do national parks love volunteers and give you opportunities to actually experience what it's like to be a ranger, state parks and local parks are also looking for volunteers who want people who can help them tell their stories as well. Great advice. One hundredth. This is our one hundredth. And we're so happy that we were here today at the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. We even have a studio audience. So my, some of my family is here. They're watching. They're waving at me now, which is really, really cool. But I just want you to remember, kids, that we know that you are the world changers. We know that you're the ones that can make great decisions to make our world a better place. So learn as much as you can about this place, about all the national parks around you, and get out and, and just be a good human. Thank you so much for having us here Thank today. You. From Dr. Drizzle and Ranger Jason, we are out of here. <laughs>